allow me, if you will, to share with you what makes rights law work. Imagine uh, a coin. On one side, you have human rights. On the other side, you have human responsibilities. One cannot exist without the other. I'll give you an example, and in fact, Gufu, you mentioned it, the right to life, the most important right that we have. For indeed, if we don't have the right to life, what do we have? You can be up a mountain shouting your right to freedom of speech, but if someone comes along and shoots you, you no longer have your right to life, and you certainly no longer have your right to freedom of speech. But your right to life is governed and protected by the criminality of the loss of that life. So your right to life is therefore protected by the responsibility not to kill. And that is enshrined in our legislation, in our criminal laws. Uh, at a one-to-one -one level, that's the crime of murder, or it's also known as homicide in America. But when it comes to the collective right to life, then we're looking at crimes against humanity, genocide. And indeed, here we are today celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But looking forward to the next 70 years, or not even the next 70 years, but the next 700 years or 7,000 years, how do we ensure the responsibility to protect not just life, but all life. And this is where I say there is missing criminal law. If we are to protect the right to nature's rights, the right to the Earth's right to life, then we are missing the crime of ecocide. Now, on Thursday evening here in The Hague, uh, in conjunction with the annual assembly to the International Criminal Court, which I've now been attending for the last four years, we launched a remarkable initiative. It is an independent preliminary examination into ecocide crime. In particular, a special iteration of ecocide crime that affects us most of all at this time and that we're most concerned with is climate ecocide. How do we ensure that the responsibility to protect our very earth against the worst excesses of climate breakdown? Well, you may say that climate negotiations are not managing to answer that question. And indeed, it's happening as I stand here, the 24th year of climate negotiations in Poland. And in these negotiations, even the very report, the ICC report, the most comprehensive report that we have on climate science today, that has been already approved by every single government in the world, cannot be agreed upon for keeping it in the text. This is a very sorry state of affairs when it comes down to negotiating over climate breakdown. The IPCC report tells us we have just 12 years to make rapid reductions. That doesn't mean in 12 years' time, that means to address the issue today. Now, our independent climate crime preliminary examination is following a very precise protocol. It's exactly the same process as the International Criminal Court itself applies when it opens up a case file, when it looks at an atrocity crime. There are certain procedures and there are certain hurdles that have to be overcome in law to see whether or not it's established as an atrocity crime. However, our challenge in the 21st century is unique here. Unlike the crimes of the 20th century, we have different challenges. Let me give you an example. 
And this is not in any way to belittle existing atrocity crimes. I am one person who stands very strongly for atrocity crimes, for them to be bolstered and strengthened. But if we look at genocide, genocide is very much a crime that was committed, created in the 20th century, and very sadly, still and can, does continue today. But we would be in a far worse place if we didn't have it on our statute books. Genocide, you can identify. You can identify where it's happening, to whom it's happening to, why, what is the intent behind it. And the consequences are very explicit. Sometimes you can even actually identify precise numbers. But climate crime brings with it a whole new set of challenges. Climate breakdown transcends time and space. We're also looking at something that can be a future crime. However, we have the knowledge today of what can happen in our tomorrows, in our lifetimes and other future generations. So in order to examine this, by opening up a case file to see how we can meet these challenges, challenges that bring such serious harm that we're looking at climate migration to the tune of millions of people, deaths to the tune of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. This could be the most enormous atrocity crime of our time. So what we have done by opening up our preliminary examination is we have identified one particular aspect of climate crime. And we have looked to the one industry that causes more harm through carbon emissions than any other. Now, this is not my say-so. This is based on an amazing body of evidence uh, prepared by the Climate Accountability Institute. And their reports, the carbon major reports, I'm sure some of you already know, identified that just 91 companies in the world are responsible for 78% of carbon emissions. Not just carbon emissions, all greenhouse gas emissions. That is an enormous number that we're looking at. And out of that carbon majors report, we have identified one company in particular that we're treating as our suspects to open up this investigation. And that company is, I'm sure, known very well to you, as is a company based here in The Hague, and it is Shell. So our primary suspects are the CEO of Shell International, that's Ben Van Burden, the CEO of Shell Netherlands, um, Marianne Van Loon, and also we're looking at not just corporate crime, but the possibility of also state crime. And we've identified the climate minister, Eric Wiebes. So we're asking the question, is there a missing responsibility to protect in crime? in law, to protect all life, not just human life. Now, if you would like to know more about this, we are publicly sharing our every step of the way. We think transparency in this is very important. And there's another body of research that we're looking at that we're very concerned and we want to examine more closely. And that's based on the fantastic work undertaken by my fellow lawyers at the Centre for International Environmental Law. And their report is called Smoke and Fumes, which came out last year, which identifies that the fossil fuel industry knew about climate breakdown. Their own scientists advised them on it over 30 years ago. But knowledge is one thing. In law, we know that knowledge is an essential component of some crimes. However, we're not just looking at knowledge here, we're looking at what is done with that knowledge. And the suggestion from that report, which we will be examining in, in closer detail, is whether or not there was an intent to deceive the public, to cause confusion 
as to whether or not climate breakdown was being and continues to be exacerbated by the climate industry. Now, you may say that this is an epic David and Goliath journey, and I think it probably is. But it's also about justice. It's about truth. And it's about standing up and saying, if this amounts to an atrocity crime, then it must end. Now, you may say that I have vested interest. Of course, I am the lawyer who has been advancing an international crime of ecocide now for eight years. But I am also pragmatic. If this is not made out as an atrocity crime, then I shall say so, because I'm the first to know from my own court practice there is little point in running a case if you shan't succeed. But we shall also be examining that if it cannot fit under existing international criminal law, then we shall make suggestions of what that missing crime can be. And I hope you will all join us in this journey. To do so, you can find the, the proceedings of our independent investigation at earth-law.org slash climate crime. Come and join us and see where it takes us. I think maybe, just maybe, there's an opportunity here to allow a greater legacy for humanity, for the earth and for future generations to be put in place. But also it's more than that. It's how we choose to step forward to make this world a better place. Thank you.